Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 185 for Monday, October 8th, 2018. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast you know us by foreign about working musicians. Here, as usual, in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Out in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you doing on this lovely Monday here, Mr. Kent? It is a lovely Monday. Doing good, Mr. Hamilton. That's good. That's good. I'm exhausted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you just, I'm just going to say it straight out. <laughs> I'm just going to say it straight. Yeah, I'm in the middle of, uh, let's see, how many days in a row have I been on stage? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right. Mm. Yeah. Cause I had a fling gig a week ago, Sunday, and then dress rehearsal, dress rehearsal, performance, 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 loadout, uh, for, so I had a, as, as sometimes happens, I did an entire run of a theater show from set up rehearsal, do the show to load out since we spoke the last time. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was a show called if then, Written by the same guys that did a show I did a number of years ago called Next to Normal, which um, they they like to write uh, clever songs that sound like rock and roll. But heaven forbid, I, the, 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 the feeling that I had this time was exactly the same as the last one that uh, I did by these guys, which was if I feel myself comfortable, it's because I'm wrong. Um, you know, there's just weird, like seven bar phrases or tunes where, you know, they add a beat for no good reason, at least no musically good reason. It may, it actually right. makes perfect sense with, you know, what, what's happening on stage. This was a story they, they like to write sort of, well, frankly, bipolar stories. The last one was actually if, uh, next to normal was about a, a bipolar woman. And, uh, this one is about a woman who is, uh, you, you as the audience are seeing her live two completely different tracks of parallel tracks of her life. So it's the same constant sort of bouncing back and forth uh, thing and uh, between two different characters played by the same person. Yeah. You know, it strikes me listening Crazy. to you tell these stories. Um, you do more dates as a pit musician now than as a, rock musician now that's not i think you get what i'm trying to say you're a rock musician no matter what but you are doing more th you're you're doing more theater gigs than you are cover band gigs right now uh that's probably been true the last couple of months yeah Interesting. yeah because right because i did well i did 10 dates of tommy and then you know five dates of this and then i'll do nine dates of uh, Brechtones, which is what we start rehearsing for tonight. Brechtones yeah. sort of blurs the lines a little more between that, but but certainly, you know, could it's arguably a theater gig. Uh, so check it out. Going yeah, going in different directions. I love this this juxtaposition. You're saying we're going into rehearsals for this. I have a gig that I've done as a solo gig for several years. That they say, you know, we want to do more. We want to do more upbeat material. Can you put together a small combo? Yep. And um, so I think I've shared with you a couple of times. I have a lot of people who over the years say we should do something together. Right. We've had sure. that conversation on air. Yes. You know, let's do something together. Of course. So for this gig, which will be four to six times a year at this one venue. I have no. And again, going back to what I was talking about last week about the, you know, the stuff that I get myself into. Um <laughs> I <laughs> the stuff we yeah the stuff we get ourselves into that's pretty much the uh, the subtitle of this this uh, this whole podcast right there you go so I uh, I I took a bunch of guys who I like you know some guys who I've played with in different things in the past and said hey you know you guys want to you know do this gig yeah here's the deal I'm going to send you a list there will be no rehearsals you show up and we play. Right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pick brain surgery music, but you know, the expectation is this. And, um, so the guys are, uh, two of them are well-known quantities and two of them are okay known quantities. So our buddy, Chris Breen is going to play keyboards for me. Oh, nice. 
Yep. So it's great to see Chris and, you know, Chris and I know each other a long time and, you know, I know him to be a very astute musician. He knows, he knows how much he needs to prepare. He knows how much to leave himself room that he'll be fine. He just uses his time really well. Jeff Cohen played in the Springsteen gig that I did and a great guitar player. Um, The bassist is a friend of mine who, um, he he was in the last. Remember, I've told you about that that uh, band I had a couple of years ago called Black Sunday Road Show. Yeah, a sixteen piece band. Yeah. <clears throat> so Josh uh, Baker filled in at the end of the term that that band was together, and then um, the drummer who I met, who was in Steve Psychotis's um, Fogarty tribute, who I just loved, nice guy, great drummer, is the drummer. So five pieces. Um, I said, Hey, I've got four to six guaranteed things a year. You guys have all said you want to do more stuff. Here's a good chance for us to, you know, hang out together. Nothing big. I'm not calling it a band. It's still just going to be built under my name. You know, just, it's going to be when people show up, there's just going to be a band there instead of anything. And I'm, you know, I don't think anybody wants to play anymore. You're going from gigs that were solo gigs to how many people on stage at, at, for any one of these gigs? It'll be all five of them. Oh, it will. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. So yeah, it's this not, was that story not... I was telling you about that, that um, it was a solo gig and a great solo gig. Right. But over time, it went from being a great solo gig, you know, once a month, great play, great pay to eight times a year to six times a year because right. new booking guys are getting involved and, and getting their, you know, their, their people involved. And, you know, I remember I asked the question about, would it be right for me to go right to the venue? Because I've had this long yeah, relationship. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's that gig. And um, the only reason I'm going to keep it as a gig, because it's going in the wrong direction, is that um, it's close to home. Sure. It's, it's a great place to play. And I can justify it in my mind by saying, hey, you know, I'm just going to have these guys come and just it's it's almost like a sit in. I mean, I'm basically what I'm going to do is creating Paul's fake book. And right. I'm going right. to have I'm going to have two or three guys at every instrument. So if one guy can't make it, it's not a big deal. Like I said, it's not a rehearsed thing. I don't care if you have charts on stage. It's not even on stage. It's it's a it's kind of a gigantic in patio a type of thing. Sure. Yeah. 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 And um, so it's just a, another approach to doing this. And, and again, I'm, I bring this up because. It's the things we get ourselves into. You are in um, rehearsal required environments. Well, um, for that, yeah, for last week. Well, for last week's show and this week's show, right? It, you're right. It's it's for for those absolutely rehearsal required. Yeah. And uh, it, yeah, because because you've got this cast that's learned the show and this band that's learned the show. And now you need to integrate the two right in, in this yep. thing that that actually is going to flow in front of an audience and, and needs to look smooth. Although I will say the way Brecktones is coming together, that. I, I honestly, I will have a whole lot more to say about Brecktones a week from now after we've gone through these rehearsals and, and actually opened the show because it is uh, it's a show about a bar band. Right. So we we are playing the part of the bar band, uh, but it's the fourth wall doesn't exist. Um, the you know, there will be interaction with the audience. Uh, so I, it'll, it'll be really interesting. And there is a story for sure. I mean, I mean, but, but there are moments of improvisation and moments of, uh, yeah. just kind of left up to chance, if you will. Yeah, you so, talked about it last week. It yeah. actually sounds really cool. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious Very creative. what I say about this a week from today, right? <laughs> it, well, because I'll know what the show is about. I, I, you know, I'm rewinding two years to when we did bitter pill, at this point in in time with that schedule, I had no idea what the show was going to be. And and then, of course, you know, a week later, it was like, oh, whoa, holy crap. Like, this is a thing. Yeah. So I'm look- th- that part I'm looking forward to in a big way. Totally yeah. get it. So so the reflection is, you know, the, a lot of this, especially classic rock cover material is not brain surgery. You know, it's been in our psyche, you know, for many of our lives, you know, if, if, you know, if you're in a stage of life that I am and you've been playing for a while. Sure. And so I think about, you know, the house rockers, we have, we have rehearsals where new, new material comes together. Boom. And I'm, I'm, I, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking about when we've had like a special gig coming up, a wedding gig where we have to prepare a first song or something like that, or, you know, other things where we want, where I tell the guys, we need to move quickly on this and guys come in, they're prepared and we're done. And I don't even know if we really needed the rehearsal for it, right? What kind of, once you get to that level of trust that everybody will prepare, you can kind of go with it. 
house rocker rehearsals, we rehearse our vocals that always, you know, and, and certainly me in particular, we need a lot of repetitions in order for that to kind of sink in. And then we also have like show flow things that, you know, require rehearsal. Yeah. And then we have out of the norm things like extended breakdowns or, you know, you know, parts that we write that, sure. uh, that go into that stuff obviously requires, it takes the most rehearsal time, but I'm, I'm, I've always been on this show about, you know, be good, you know, be, be prepared, know your stuff, do your stuff. Right. And I, and in moving to this, I'm, I don't change my mind that that is still a requirement for putting a quality product out there. But what I'm doing is I'm putting the onus of that on me. I have to know all the words. I have to know the songs well enough that if the guys behind me are not had a different interpretation of something that I can guide us out of any pit we might fall in on this type of stuff. It, I still take the responsibility for that, but I know the guys well enough that they can play these four chord songs, three chord songs, six chord songs, you know, fairly well. Yep. Uh, you know, so will, will and, this just be uh, like, like if Chris shows up and says, Hey, uh, if everybody knows, you know, the two chords to feeling all right, you want to do it. I'll sing it. Like, is it, are you throwing vocals around or is it Paul sings no. everything and you no, just have a backup, a backup band. band for me? Got yeah, it. it's a backup band for Got me. It. So, so the onus of leading still is on me. Yep. You know, it's still my reputation. Along with that goes my brand that, you know, still putting something quality out there. So I have to be quite prepared and I'm assuming that all the guys will be quite prepared as well. But I also know it's it's, you know, there's finite amount of time. That I'm not I'm not building in any time to spot check things. Sure. In that, if you pick the right guys, if you pick the right guys, that will drive them to know that they have to be on point as well. Right. Yeah. So this if you is pick like the wrong guys that, you know, that they'll be like, oh, we'll figure our way through it. That to me would be a red flag. But I'm picking guys who know like, OK, I get it. Here's here's what he's expecting. He's been pretty clear about what he's expecting. Um, I need to know roadmaps. I need to know chords. I need to have big ears. And we can we can do better than just get through things. We can actually play some stuff together. And again, I'm I'm very carefully picking songs that are don't have a lot of complexity to it. Here's a great example. I came across um, a really beautiful version of American Pie done by John Mayer on David Letterman. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, American pie is long, but very repetitive, right? Yep. You know, it's, it's just a lot of verses. And then there's a couple of places where it breaks down a little bit. That's a, that's a really good example to illustrate what I'm talking about here. The onus on knowing the song and knowing all those verses is on me, the onus on the, but it's re repetitive. So I believe these guys will be fine. And everybody kind of knows the song in their head, you know, so you're starting from a common frame of reference. There is, you know, where, where it breaks down and then where it builds back up again. And just me being able to lead the band with a hand signal or a look or something like that is, you know, what I expect to myself and how I throw the guys a life raft to get through, to get you through know, the some team. changes. Of things, sure. Right. Because, you know, when you don't know something, repetitiveness is the key. You know, if, if like when we play music that I just don't know, uh, just the number of times you do it, the better you get at it. But, you know, this stuff, I'm not thrown in any, you know, amazing funky breaks the first time. They're mostly songs that people identify with the story of this lyric or of the melody or something like that. And, you know, I'm kind of sticking very carefully to that type of planned thing. And again, the guys so can have charts in front of them. I'm curious how this goes because I, and I'm curious, and I may never have the answer to this question, well, but well, I'll ask a different question. How, how many of these guys do you think are actually going to sit down and play through these tunes before the gig? All of them. I know th that's why I picked them. Huh? Would you expect me to be on that list? I would ask you if you'd sign up for it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I would. I, I would. No, no, no. I, I mean, it would, would be my first call for this type of thing, and I would ask you here. You know, here's what it's going to look like. You need to know, and you need to be able to get through it. Um, you know, you need to follow. You need to have big ears. You know, but you need to know the songs. You need to know the forms. Um, you know, that's what the expectation is. Yeah. And if you were to it, say, yeah, if, you I, called, you know, if you called me for a gig like this, I would tell you I will be prepared. Like I, I like and I know I would be right, but I would probably never sit down at my drums and actually play through these tunes. I'd have them going in on the background. I would look through the charts. I might make a note on a chart about like if I hear, oh, there's this turnaround or something. OK, I got to know that or whatever. I might. But write that's that what down. I would expect. I mean, again, yeah. drums, you can a little bit get away with that more than Correct. portal instruments. 
Right. So, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Totally. Yeah. I don't. I don't expect people to spend a thousand hours mm. for six gigs a year memorizing them. I've picked songs that are loose enough that there's a little room. Um, you know, where the room to listen. How's that? So yeah. room. Yeah. But if you come in prepared enough, and you have big ears, and you're watching the leader. You know, well, we that's can get it, it, right? I, like part of my decision to of, of how much to prepare would be how much do what do I know about you? And of course, you and I have played together enough that I know quite a bit, and I know you're going to cue me when there's a stop. When you're going to cue me at the at the end of a tune or whatever. Like communication is not a problem, right? With with you, and that's right. that's going to help this gig happen. Yeah, that's, that's right. And all these guys I have some familiarity with, you know, I know what they're capable of. I know how good they are. I know that they're good communicators. I know that they have the desire to be successful. They don't, they Mm -hmm. don't, um, they don't believe their own press that much. They're humble enough to say, I get it. This is the role in this group, you know, that type of thing. And that's what, and again, American pie is the best example. Everybody knows to some degree, American pie, it's in your, it's in your brain. Sure. Right. Um, this has a few, that's that, that can be a liability, right? Because what you're descri- what you're describing is uh, not all that different from what we did in Chafed when Chafed played regularly, and 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 then the acoustic spinoff of Chafed, which is called Monkey Fist, where rehearsals almost never happened. Right? I mean, occasionally, mm-hmm. but but even like the first three or four gigs we did without any rehearsals, and then it was like, oh, okay, all right, we should polish this part up, or you know, if we got together or whatever. But harmonies, grooves, everything came together on stage with mm-hmm. with both of those bands, like uh, John and I. I don't know that we've ever rehearsed harmonies together, but, but, you know, we just locked right in with each other and it's, it's great. But where the liability comes is, well, if you're expecting perfection, then it will not be right. There's there, you, cause you're not going to get perfection without a rehearsal. However, uh, the other liability is if I know brown eyed girl and that guy knows brown eyed girl and that guy knows brown eyed girl and, you know, and, and we get halfway through the tune, it's like, oh, well, you know, which are we doing like the bar band version of this where the bass player takes a double turnaround in the middle, right? Like these, these are questions that are going to be there mm-hmm. and, and everybody's just going to have to kind of look at each other. I mean, it's, it's the, it, it's the American girl test, right? If we rewind about a year and a half where, you know, if you have that song on your list and no one has asked how it ends, no one has really prepared, right? Because that that's the because that song fades out on the record. So it's like, all right, how are we going to end this? You know, those sorts of things can be a liability or, you know, with Brown Eyed Girl, the same kind of thing. Like, how do we end this? Do we stop and do the last turnaround a cappella? Do we what you know, what do we do? How's that going to work? So let's talk about endings for a second. Here. Yeah. That's a good place. That's a good place to pause. So to me, in an environment like this, I tell the guys, watch me for endings. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's basically almost always an end on the one. Just hit it. And let sure. It burn, right. Sure. And that's the easiest way to get through something like this. And that's that's the difference. And, and if you want to build a band that's known for show. Then you're stringing together endings. You're doing different things. Totally. I know this environment. This is, like I said, this is a fake book environment. This is mm-hmm. a rock and roll fake book. This, I, I, I just sent one of the guys a note the other day. We are, we are pioneering the genre of winery rock here, right? People are kind of <laughs> sipping. Most people are facing us, but most people are just kind of absorbing that there's this pleasant music happening. And, it, you know, again, I did it as a solo acoustic gig for, for many years. Um, it's now, you know, they just want something more upbeat. That's what they want to present yeah. to their patrons. I could have said no, but in saying yes, I'm like, well, what is the thing that'll make us successful? And that's the vibe is that people are there. Um, there, many are there to have a sip and take in some music. Many are there to have a sip and the and the music is in the is in the background. Um, so it can't be horrifically loud, um, but they want a combo. And then if someone would want to get up and dance, you know, can you give them a reason to do that? So I've picked, let me just actually take a look here. There's a lot of petty in, in the list. Um, there's a lot of kind of like acoustic, um, stuff. So, uh, waiting on the world to change John Mayer. Yep. That's pretty, typical of the tempos nothing too terribly aggressive 
stuff you can sip wine to, tap your toe to, and go, oh, that's clever. You know, oh, oh, I like that song. So uh, mid, end of mid, the innocence, mid tempo, kind of uh, all like one step up from wallpaper kind of stuff. Well. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, I mean, but that's what you're describing, right? I mean, that's that, that you, that's what you've described as the gig is it, it can't be too in your face. It can't be too uh, distracting. Right. You know, they yeah. just right. So, I mean, so that's that's what they want. Distract. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And so yeah, but I don't, the last say, that, three I don't songs. say that to be I, that's just I would use that to describe my gig. You know, <laughs> if, if that's what I were playing, it's like, you know, you got to know what you're going into. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Last three or four songs will, you know, will give them something to remember. And, sure. and that's that's the strategy to the whole thing. But, yeah. you know, some of the other songs, uh, You Don't Know How It Feels, Tom Petty. Mm-hmm. End of the Innocence, Don Henley. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So mid-tempo uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. One Headlight, The Wallflowers. Right. That'd be, the, that's starting to get a little heavier. A little bit. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. actually right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Crazy Love, Van Morrison. Yeah. Banana pancakes, Jack Johnson. Right. That's so, cool. Yeah. 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 I'm, yeah I'll okay. stay away now, from the wallpaper, now, you know, model, but uh, yeah, I, I, well, I feel what you're saying. Well, but it's, yeah, but it's, it's certainly not energy at the level that you would put on stage with the house rockers. Right. I mean, you're, you're different not, gig, different vibe, that's what different I'm saying. venue, a, different brand, different everything. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And again, to me, it's a solo gig. I would, I would play many of these songs, solo acoustic. There happen to be some guys coming behind me. And like I said, the whole strategy, again, it's four to six gigs a year. I have no ish interest. It's basically replacing four to six acoustic gigs a year. Right. It's um, not doing, a band. You're I, doing your own sound for it or you you bringing in somebody to do sound for you? Um, again, the, the venue is, since there's only one vocalist, I'll just bring my bows. Everybody else will just play. It's, mm. it's really, you know, a, the, a, keep yeah, it simple. At, yeah, that's good. Keep it simple. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, even with the bows, um, you know, I've got a four channel mixer. I could, I could put an eight channel mixer on it if I wanted to, sure. you know, uh, all effects built in, you know, volume should be enough where you can hear and, you know, and trying not to overthink this is really important. You know, getting a setup where, you know, all the instruments are at a reasonable volume, semi-circle type of yeah. setup. So, you know, people can hear, but that's the idea. That's cool. So yeah, it it's uh it's it's fake book rock and roll put to put to work, right? And you know the plan is if one of the guys gets sick or doesn't want to do it because the pay isn't great, um, uh, you, a, you know you I a roster. Have, yeah, I've got a roster. I've got a I've got a bench that I can go through. Yeah. Well, and if you know if if you can't get a keyboard player for one gig, like you could you could survive that. Right. Yeah. Oh, you know. speaking of which, yes, check sir. this out, man. Just to change gears a little, we did our first house rocker gig without Nick the other night. It was a it was a decent did sized you, gig. It was did you sub carpool. him out, or did, did you not just no keyboards? I chose not to. So it was I chose you, you, not to. You put you went on stage in the missing man formation. That's right. <laughs> well, that, there was that's a, what there we was call a big it. hole in my heart and a big hole on the side of the stage. And, um, but you know, in one way we've been talking about how, like we, you and I kind of like think about how to make things different in one way. I saw it as an opportunity and a challenge, right? Mm-hmm. I saw it as, well, it's going to be rock and roll night. Cause basically all of Simon and my uh, songs are rock songs. So it wasn't a rock and soul night. It was a rock and roll night. And I kind of put that out there a little bit. I did tell people in advance, you know, Nick won't be there for that one. Sure. Um, uh, we did have some people who don't follow us to get that message. Like, Hey, can you play your Bruno Mars stuff tonight? <laughs> I'm like, Oh no, Nick's out of town tonight. <laughs> Turns out no. Tonight's yeah. rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, no, we, you know, we went heavy on the rock stuff. Um, there was some stuff that sounded sparser, of course, of course, but nobody died. And there were right. some harmonies that, that were missing a part, but nobody died. And, um, uh, let's see. Russ had just got off a plane coming back from vacation in France for a mildly jet lag guy. He was really good. They're like the grooves are really relaxed. And, nice. and uh, to me, it was fun. I think the, um, what wasn't fun was being aware of the stress that the other guys felt about it. Like they weren't so sure, you know, because it was, it was you know, obviously a pretty big change. Um, and then as the evening went on and we were going over real well, I think they, had more fun with it. And, um, but to me, it was like, I, myself, I haven't sung a whole house rockers gig 
yeah. since before Nick joined the band, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, I did 90% of the singing and uh, it was, it, you know, I liked the challenge of that. It was really good. And, it's, and I'm reminded that two hours of singing in a loud, two and a half hours of singing in a loud rock band is way di- different than three hours of singing a solo acoustic gig. I mean, you're reminded the muscles you're using and the endurance that you need and the focus that you need was a different thing. And um, it was to me, again, it was a, it was a learning experience. It's now good to know we can do it if we ever have to do it again. I wouldn't prefer to do it again, but, um, you know, we played Boys Are Back in Town. We added keyboards to that, of which there were none in the beginning, and it went over great. And it was, you know, really a good tune for us. A lot of the petty stuff. You know, there's some places in American Girl where you do have a beautiful organ part or something like that. It was a little sparser. But then also we have a five piece horn section. So there's just a different just sound say, coming you, out. You guys get plenty of sound going. Yeah, we did our. Play so, Dancing in the Dark, right? So the Dancing oh, yeah. in the Dark is, um, that's, a, that's a synth that does that, that um, melody line, right? But we just have five horns doing it and it, it's not the same, but people dance their butts off and seem to have a really good time with it. So it was to me a, a learning experience. It was a good challenge. Um, it wasn't a hundred percent relaxed for me because I was keenly aware that I had to get a little bit more buy-in from some parts of the band. Um, and once we got there, it was actually pretty fun for me. So that that's interesting. Cause our, our last fling gig was, was not the first, but uh, the one we did a week ago, Sunday, we had to do without Aaron, uh, who is our keyboard player and sings uh, probably more than anyone else in the band. He and I probably, well, I don't know it, uh, on any given gig. I, I would say that that it's either he or I that winds up singing, you know, the 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 largest number of songs, and and then the other guy's number two. Uh, but really, you know, the the most of the other guys in Fling are fine doing gigs without Aaron, uh, almost to the point where they're like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like we can go put a band on stage; it's great. You know, I'll sing more. They'll say or whatever. And it, you know, it. Um, so, so it's almost the reverse of what you experienced where, you know, you were, you were enjoying it, but worried about what the other guys were thinking. Whereas when, uh, Aaron's not there for us and fling, we can do it. We've, you know, we've had scenarios where last minute his plane didn't land or whatever. And, and we had to go and do a, you know, a two set or maybe even a three set gig. Actually we have, we've done a couple of three set gigs without him. And, but you know, it's like, it's just not fun. For mm. me, it feels like we're just putting a uh, just a, a kind of a, a plain old rock band up on stage. Right. Because all the things that we do are integrated with the five of us. And so taking one of those out and you sort of have to, in a sense, dumb it all down uh, to a level where it's like, yeah, it just I mean, it it puts a whole lot more pressure on obviously everybody else. But it also just like I miss out on all the harmonies that we've worked out together, yep. it, you know, and, and, and that's a thing that, that actually separates us. Right. We don't have five horns. So those harmonies that we do in fling are kind of a thing. And and then also the fact that there's a piano, not a piano, but, you know, a, a electric piano on stage uh, as part of the sound is also a thing. Right. And it it he absolutely adds, you know, both vocally and instrumentally a lot of stuff. And so I just like, I don't, it, it's, it is absolutely not my preference. And in fact, I wind up being the one that, that, you know, tries to veto those scenarios and, and for us, we can do them. Uh, it's fine, mm-hmm. but we get through it, but I, it's, I, either I'm wrong or the rest of the band, not the rest of the band, right? I don't think Russ likes it when we do uh, gigs without Aaron, but the other guys are like, oh no, it's great. And so either they're right or I'm right, but I don't, I, I think, I think I'm right. I don't think we're that great without him. Well, just to throw this on the wall, here's yeah. the interesting thing. I would like to believe my, my glass half full perception is that somebody coming to see us. Now I'm going to set aside. I'm going to set aside the people who come for the, you know, the, some Bruno Mars. And, sure. You know, that, sure. That's, but I'm just going to say the people who know our band the most, again, I, I put it out there and said, Hey, you know, it's going to be a different night, different house rockers night. Yeah. They still chose to come. I'm assuming many of those people got the message somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, I would imagine that they said it's different. That they, they wouldn't deconstruct the music quite as much as much as the experience that they would be like, Oh, good for those guys. They, they, they're getting it through. They're getting done with it. Oh, 
yeah, you know, it's fun. It, 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 it's different. It's, you know, I don't think they would be, oh, it's really missing. And again, I didn't pick songs. Sure. I well, would you, say the weirdest one that that I that I threw in there because I felt that we could do it was smooth. All right, so smooth obviously has that kind of Latin rhythm that the piano plays. Yep, and drives a lot of the bus of that. So all but I did was totally play straight doable. chords over it. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's doable without keys for sure. I've done yes. that one. Yep. So a I picked songs that I felt in in general there wouldn't be such an obvious hole. Um. And remember, there's a gazillion cover bands that play a lot of these songs without keyboards players. And let me just take a little left well, turn but here. That's 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 actually my point is, you know, you've crafted a thing and and just by definition, without having keys on stage, you don't have keys on stage. Right. So yes. so it is more generic. Uh, it, obviously, you've got, you know, five horns, which makes you less generic. Right. But <laughs> but but, you know, it, it's it's veering towards that. And, and, you know, while people might be tolerant of it occasionally, and of course, I, I know you're not planning on doing this on a regular basis, right? I, you know, if it did become a regular thing where one gig a month had to be without Nick for, you know, for whatever reason, I, you know, the people that want the Bruno Mars and all that, I, I think would you would be, destroy your brand with the you inconsistency, would you would destroy yeah. your ba- brand with the inconsistency and that is the thing that, you know, aside for me from just missing out on, oh, we didn't get to like do any of those harmonies that we worked out. There's no Beatles songs in the set. There's none of this stuff that actually is part of our brand, but also part of my enjoyment of it too, right? Like I have to take that and set it aside for this particular gig. Um, you know, it, at some point, and what I don't, I don't worry as much about the people that know the band and come and say, ah, oh, okay, right. You guys are going to have mm. to make it through tonight without Aaron. I worry about the people that show up and see us for the first time, but they don't know any difference. And that's, so, but know, that's why they'll just say, you have? They'll, well, that's the thing, right? Is it, is this the product you want them to see? And now those people know the house rockers as a band. That's a nine piece band with five horns and it's, you know, guitar rock most of the night. I think you have to be good enough to get them to come out and see you one more time, right? Like don't, uh, yeah, don't, lament, don't lament what you aren't, weren't able to give them that sure. day. Right. And, and again, let me just give you the backstory. There's so two, two things here. One is this particular gig, it just, the stars lined up that it was an okay gig to do this on. Totally. It's a reasonably low pressure gig. Yep. You know, it's at a church carnival, um, not a huge dancing crowd, a lot of walk by crowd. Some people, you know, some dancing, um, and the other part of the story is I had to miss this gig last year because I had to go out of town for work. Uh, and uh, they subbed me last year. Right. So, you know, Steve, my friend, Steve yeah, you know, played my that. part. So there yep. was still the same, same instrumentation. Right. Um, but I didn't want to do this to this particular organizer. We've played this gig for 10 years and I felt bad that, you know, two years in a row, I, I definitely didn't want to bail on him. So sure. again, I, I yeah, made you, gotta, it, you, it, you, yes. you pick your, yeah, you make a choice given all the factors. Ab- no, exactly. absolutely. Yeah. 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 And that's the but scenario let me say I've this. been into. Yeah. I, I, I want to, wholeheartedly agree with you on something. I, I actually find criminally so sadly, there are just so few good keyboard piano players, right? Yeah. There are synth players. There are people who can, you know, program patches and do that type of stuff, but really trained piano pianists, keyboard yeah. players are really hard to find. And I have a great one. I mean, I have an extraordinary one yep. and it, it adds a sweetness to the songs that you play that is really just not reproducible in anything else. And having a keyboard in a band, I think by itself, now let me get, I, I want to be careful about the use of these terms. I don't know how you would clarify. You say keyboardist and you kind of are including the guys who are not really trained players. They're more kind of like programmers than they are, than they are. Technicians. Yeah, no, I, I'm talking about people that can play. Yeah. Right. Somebody that can bring it's an instrument and just, and just lay it down. That's right. Yeah. It, it opens you up to, sounds and moods and and productions that are just you know you can't do impossible Im- without it impossible right. yep. and again you may if you have a three-piece or a four-piece band you're probably picking material that is based upon that and good for you but what i'm saying is a band like ours that wants to we we go for the letter of the law where where it's needed to be but we really take a lot of license with the spirit of the law in sure. in terms of you know creating our stuff it's very, very hard to do that without a brilliant keyboardist. And I, it's just so sad to me. Half the guys in my band are music teachers 
there are so few people taking piano lessons anymore that with the intent of playing popular music, classical, you know, I think is still, you know, an, an, an art that a lot of uh, parents encourage their children to, to pursue, but, but popular music, it seems like there are so few and it's a hassle. There's a lot of gear, a lot of heavy gear, you know, to lug around. You're almost like a drummer that you've you know, got to get there first and, you know, you're out there last. And, yep. and, um, but the music that I love, I love obviously guitar players, but, but bands that have piano, piano and organ, you know, I, I'm actually not that much for, for synth sounds, but, but that, those are essential sounds to rock and roll to me. And well, and um, if you're playing eighties, anything from the eighties, you know, you need to have kind of synth some kind of synth sound. And, and I've found yeah. you don't, you, you can pick like one, and and cover all of the 80s with that for the most part right like it, as long as it's synthy people don't really care Patty, if it's yeah. exactly you know the patch that that they used here or they used there or whatever i mean right. if you're doing an 80s tribute night maybe right you know but otherwise yeah you can get away with it yeah yeah yep. yeah so anyway, that's a little detour about uh, about keyboard players, and and it was just interesting doing a, a gig without Nick. I, I don't want to do that, right? right? I have, right? You know, you know, he's he's my buddy. He's great. He he, you know, delivers the goods night after night. I mean, he's you know that is part of the house rocker sound. But I do, I did recognize when I made the decision to keep doing, doing the gig that it was a good challenge for me um, in terms of endurance and chops. Uh, I underestimated that the band would be so tentative in the beginning of the gig. Um, even just kind of walking around, they're like, ah, oh, you know, how's, how's this going to go? And, uh, that kind of, you know, I had to kind of like, I'm sensitive. And so I want everybody to be like, yes, we're a team. We're going for it. Right. But guys, not everybody's wired that way. Right. right. You know, guys totally. will say what's on their mind. Yeah. And so I had to like very consciously you know, say to myself, all right, these guys need a little religion. They need a little proof. I'm going to go out and I'm going to play my butt off and lead by example and say that, you know, as a team, we can accomplish anything we want if we're all, if we're all on the same page about it. And I think we got there at the end of the night. Again, did I don't you, think. Did you talk about it? Did you mention to the crowd that there was someone missing at any point nope. in time? Okay, nope. good. <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You never apologize. I mean, you no. never tell them, yeah, no. you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I think when I miss it last year, Nick did a shout out and said, we miss our guy. And, you know, that was very sweet. And you sure. know, maybe that would have been appropriate. But um, but uh, again, it was the same instrumentation. So it was a little bit different. That's so I didn't different. want to call yeah, attention. Exactly. Right. Well, that's call it. Attention. You never want to point out what you're missing, how unrehearsed you are, any of that. Right. It's just right. you hit the stage and it's probably Go. better. You know, it's better received than than you than it is delivered. Right. Even when you're making a mistake or something, 99 percent of the time, the people that are listening have no idea. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So this weekend I have a really interesting gig coming up. So I did a deal with a local winery. So, again, I live I live in northern California. There's wine regions all over the place. Beautiful venues. They love music to go along you know, with their tasting rooms. Yeah. Some of them yeah. have actually built. Uh, event centers for bigger things, maybe weddings or bigger. So I um, wow. entered into a partnership with a, with a good size winery that has a beautiful event center. I mean, they, and I'm talking like a, a maybe 36 foot wide by 20 foot deep step, you know, covered nice. stage with lights tenting for 500 people. Right. Oh, wow. So uh, I, I went to them and said, Hey, you know, how about we do a, a deal together and, and we kind of work through it all. And so we're doing our first. So I sell the tickets um, and I cut back to them um, a certain percentage of the tickets and I don't have to pay a rental fee for the venue. They provide the tables and the setup and the security and the, you know, and the cleanup. Right. So it's a pretty mm, good deal. That's a good deal. It's just good for both of us, but yeah. I'm also going to bring a ton of people in to taste and buy their wine. I was so just going to say, yeah, is, they're, they're not cutting you in on the wine. So they're, they're doing all right. Yep. But to me, it's a win-win, right? Oh no, so, I'm not saying I'm not saying that negatively. I'm just saying, like you know, for anybody listening, like there's 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 one more piece to the picture here, and and that's yes. it. Yeah, absolutely. But they they own the real estate, so absolutely. I mean, like, like everything else in the world, right? The, you know, yep. that that's the big part of it. Yep. Anyway, um, so I've been selling tickets for the past month. The gig is this Saturday. Ticket sales have been fan freaking tastic, um, and. Uh, it is, it is part of this new model of ways, you know, what do I do with this band? I don't, uh, you know, our, our big philosophy is we do clubs in the winter 
and clubs that we can fit in. And we have three or four regular ones that we, you know, have in a circuit that we do basically from January till May, May to October. Uh, we do uh, festivals and concert series and then whatever casuals, whatever private events, corporate or weddings that we get over the course of the year, you mix into that. But that's, that's roughly the flow of things that we do. Sure. So I have this goal to continue to make being in the, in the house rockers stratosphere, an interesting thing for our fans, find interesting places for them to come see us play is one thing, interesting environments. Um, and so I just, you know, like you do with the stone church and with flink fest, that's, you know, not many bands figure it out themselves. They're like, well, right. that's the venue. And, you know, and we play, yeah, where, where, <laughs> we play where, Home, Alabama, just like everybody else. And, you know, how give us a shot. Right. Well, you're, you're, you just, you you glossed over something which i think is the key to all of that is you are bringing your fans to interesting places right that's how you that's at least one of the things you're thinking about when you're doing these things not where would it be fun to play although that's also part of it but it's it's additionally it's like where can we bring our fans that would be fun and that's the key that most bands don't think about. Most bands, like you said, think, all right, well, you know, your club runs, uh, you know, you have bands there and nine to one and please, please let us play. And, uh, right. you know, we'll try and get people to show up. And and that's that works if you've got a group of people that come to see you that like to go to a place like that and want to be there from nine to one. But if the people that come to see you aren't exactly that, then you need to stop. And think about, OK, where like what are who are these people? Not not individually name by name, but in general, you know, how would you describe these people? What do they like? What are they into? What's their demographic? Right. If you're really going to you know, build it out and then, OK, for that type of person in this group of people. What places work? What type of event works? Like start, don't even think about places. Just think about what type of event. And then through that lens, start looking, okay, where could I host something like this pie in the sky event that I dreamed up on a napkin? Where could that actually land? Right. And, and you know, you found this winery that's got an event center and it's like, hey, wait a minute. If you've got an off night, you don't have a wedding booked. I bet this would be a cool place to do this thing. And just like we did with the Stone Church or we did with the Rochester Opera House. I mean, it it you start thinking a, a very differently when you stop leading with the time and the venue. Right. Don't lead with that. Let that yeah. be the end Leave result. The audience. Yeah. yeah. Think about your band. Think about your audience. Think about the type of show that you want to put on, the type of vibe that you want to create. And then sort of the venues become be, begin to become evident like oh right well if we could do that there at this time maybe not nine o'clock maybe it's a eight o'clock start or maybe it's a two in the afternoon start like you know depending on what your band does and who your people are that might be the right thing don't well you're fighting physics here so so you know the problem is that most most cover bands most are geographically limited, right? You you live in totally. a town, your buddies live in the town, your bandmates live in the town, your fans live in the town, maybe let's just say 50 miles around. That's probably generous. 30 miles is probably more, more right? Yeah. And yep. you can only motivate your first concentric circle of followers to come see you so many times a year, right? That's, that's right. just That's physics. Then what you do is you hopefully are, are blanketing that 30 mile radius so there's a, se a second concentric circle of people who don't know you personally, but they like music and they like your music and they'll go see you when they can. So if the first concentric circle will see you, I'd say optimistically once a month, more likely half a dozen times a year. How big is that you're, you're, you, gravity tends to pull you in thinking about only in that first concentric circle. Well, That's if I it. take this, if I take this bar gig, you know, we've got, you know, four guys in the band and each guy is married and, you know, we, they each, you know, our wives know somebody and they don't want to sit by themselves. And so, so they'll probably bring two people. You can only do that exercise so many times. Yeah. Before Your the wives success, just stay home. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The, you know, success looks like how well do you do filling in the blanks of the second concentric circle? And then the harder part, and this is where I am with the house rockers. The really hard part is extending that 
50 miles and 70 miles because sure. I know for my guys, they're like, Ugh, you know, a two hour drive for a hundred, hundred fifty dollar gig to build an audience. How many times do we have to do that before we build an audience? And that's where it gets harder. Right. Totally. You know, so, so. Yeah. Cause your, your guys are, at least many of your guys are not full-time musicians, right? So they no, have- No, half of them are is the thing. Yeah, well, that's, that's what yeah. I'm saying, but half aren't, right? So to ask them to do gigs, you know, night after night that are, you know, essentially putting them on the road, but staying at home. Oh, dude, it's the other way around. It's interesting you say that. So the guys who, who just want to play, yeah, they'll go anywhere. Oh, the, guys who put a, the guys who put a time value- you know, value on their time right? for performing. So the pros, they're like, you know, man, two hour drive, four hours in the car, you know, uh, on a night, you know, wh why do I, why would I want to do that? You know, I, I can teach two lessons and and make the same money. That So that's, that's kind of what the pros in my band's oh, response is. Yeah. Yeah. So it's exactly the opposite. Of, but I get what you're thinking is that, yeah. you know, there's other musicians who are like, you know, I make my money with my horn in my hand. Tell me where to go. And, and a hundred dollars is better than $0. Even if I have to put $10 in the gas tank. Sure. But that's, that actually isn't what I've proven out. Huh. But, but Fascinating. What you say is, is, is really the essence of it. It's if you invest in an audience and actually I want to, I want to pause really quickly. I've had, I've had two local musician friends uh, say essences of the same thing to me. I talked, I've talked about both of them on the show over the years um, they'll say, um, I know you're all about the money, which is incredible hurtful to me that that's actually what they think about. Like if they had any idea how much time it takes to put on these events, right. Or, or, you know, and to think, you yeah, know, this is, a labor no way anybody, of, this is a labor of love right here. And that's the deal. It, yeah. But and, you know, both of them have said, you know, I know you won't take that gig because it's all about the money. And, you know, when uh, I say, I think it's, I think it's absolutely essential. Now, no guy who's a true professional would ever say that to me. What the two guys who've said that to me are these kind of semi-professionals who they don't I, harshly, I'll say they don't believe that they're worth the money. It, you know, it's gotta be part of where that comes from. Sure. Um, and they're a little intimidated that, you know, someone is actually pushing an agenda where the musicians should get paid fairly for what they do. I mean, that's the only thing I can say is like, if you start with the premise that music has a value and you choose, pick and choose where you decide to give it away, that's your choice. But in general, you know, the, the, the impetus should not be on giving it away, provide something of tremendous value and ask a fair price for it. And the market will tell you if it's not a fair price, nobody will pay for nobody it. Nobody will pay for it. You know, I had, I'm going to take us on a little tangent here. I don't know about uh, maybe a month ago. Uh, my friend, Amanda, who I do a lot of gigs with, but, uh, wasn't able to do this one gig with her texted me and said, Hey, I'm in a pickle here. And it was almost like a gig gab question, right? Cause she's like, look, it, you know, I, I picked up this gig at this festival and they're going to pay me, you know, they want to pay me 150 bucks and now they want, and then they told me they want a band. And, uh, she's like, you know, I don't know what, what to do. And I told them I would bring a band. She's like, but I didn't really have the conversation about more money. And I'm like, well, you got to have that conversation. Like you can't bring, you can't, we can't have as a community, like we can't have anybody putting a four piece band on stage for 150 bucks. Like right. that, that's really going to go in the wrong direction for all of us. And she's like, yeah, but I feel like if I, uh, it, you know, if I, uh, and I hope she's okay. I think she's, a, she's all right with me telling the story. Cause it, it worked out really well. Uh, you know, she's like, well, I feel like if I go back to him, I might lose the gig. And it's like, okay, well, is this the, the gig? My question was, you know, are you willing to die on this hill? <laughs> yeah. Is this the gig you want? Right. Like you've got three other musicians, maybe four, I forget how many it was that are, you know, going to put their time in. Are they like, do they know that they're getting whatever 30 bucks for this gig? It, it, and are they cool with that? It, you know, she's like, Oh, I really haven't had that conversation. I said, right. I said, I, I, you know, if it were me, I would call them and tell them you need what you need, whether it's, I don't know, you know, however many musicians, is it 600 bucks? Is it five? Is it eight? I don't know. Right. But pick a number. And we did, we went through and she's like, yep, that, that feels fair. Okay, great. But I think she, she settled on, you know, because I didn't have the conversation, I'm just going to go with the sort of the, the default of a hundred bucks a man. Okay, great. So she went back to him and said, look, I'm bringing four of us. Maybe it was five, but let's say it was four. So I, you know, I, obviously I can't do that for 150. I'll do it for 400. And immediately the woman said, yeah, well, we'll find somebody else. And she was like, crap, I lost the gig. 
I'm like, yep. It, like, but, but it wasn't a great gig to begin with if they weren't willing to pay to, you know, to bring these people. And then five minutes later, she texted me. She's like, thank you so much. I told the other guys in the band, they couldn't possibly have been happier that I went and asked for the money that we should have gotten. And they were totally okay that not doing the gig, if the people didn't want to pay us what we were worth and you, you know, all of that, <laughs> it's like, yeah, just stand up. You, you, you know, stand up. You, you, you have to, you have to believe the value is there. You have to, have, the key. have to, you have to believe it's there. And, and part of that is, is experiential, right? By doing it, by going through exactly that exercise. And we've all been through it. Like, Oh, am I worth it? Yes, I'm worth it it. I, I tell you I'm worth it. You say I'm not worth it. Well, that's okay. I'm okay walking away. And then suddenly, you know, you get support from your peers. It's like, oh, right. Got it. That's so, it. yep. Yep. <sighs> so there you go. That's how, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's how it is. But, but you, you do, you, you like it, it's, 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 yes, it's about the money, but it's not just about the money. It's about being fair. It's, you know, you got to compensate people for their time. And, and there's clearly they want, you know, in a scenario like that, or really any scenario where somebody says, I want to have a band, but like, like with your thing with the winery, you know, instead of a, a solo, I want to have more people on stage playing instruments simultaneously. Well, Okay, that but now you see a value in this, right? Like you've communicated a value. Now and we need to have the conversation about that. It. Is, yeah, is they said that, and I said, well, you know, I'm going to need more money if you want more people. Right. And, and and the conversation wasn't no. The conversation was fair. It was like we get it. We can't pay you what we were paying you as a solo times four times five. That can't happen. Here's what we can do. Right. And they, they knew I could say yes and I could say no. And and we came to a place where it was OK. Yeah, but see that. Um, and that's a that's a I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just a negotiation. And don't ever take negotiation personally. Right. That, right. Like you got to learn that you but you go up, you stand up for what you know, you ask for what you want. You know what you need. You know what your walk away point is. You're respectful during the whole process. They're respectful and and everything's good. Like even if it doesn't work out, it's still OK. Right. Remember that. Because it's easy to to involve your sense of self worth in this con in this conversation about a product's worth, and that's really what it is. And you also have to be prepared to understand that the person on the other side gets to say no. Varying, well, they they have varying degrees of their ability to do that. For a lot of people who you're negotiating with, and this is actually a really powerful thing to understand, the guy on the other side may not be as evolved as you. And they may see a negotiation as an expression of their self-worth. <laughs> right? uh, yeah, no, so it's may, totally they true. They may be right. saying no because on the princess, on on the on the principle that, well, you know, I'm a good negotiator, I will just say no. Your ability to recognize that on the other side of the negotiation and guide someone out of that and you know, just be like, oh man, and you know, and really just kind of get them back to a place where you know, people have different levels of skill when it comes to negotiation. To be successful, you have to have more skill. Yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But skill comes from experience. So you just Agreed. do it enough and be, you know, just don't be a dick about it. Uh, you know, stand your ground. If somebody like I've, I've certainly, especially in early days, but I mean, I've, I find myself in this scenario every now and then where, you know, perhaps I'm selling something new or something I haven't done before. And I say, yeah, here's what it's worth. And, you know, you do it politely with a smile on your face. And sometimes you get somebody that'll kind of say all right, let me explain to you, you know, why, <laughs> why that why you're wrong, right? But that's okay. Like being wrong is the way to learn. That's and but I've also had somebody some people use that as a negotiation tactic. Like, oh, yeah, no, no, you don't understand. Let me explain to you why you're only worth 25 bucks a man or something. Like, you know, you got to be able to trust your gut and if you feel like you're being taken advantage of, just say, "Okay, cool, thanks. I, I got to go, you know, I'm off." But but listen because that you might there might be a lesson for you and that's okay too. Like there's nothing wrong with that. It, mm -hmm. it, if it's, it, you will know if you are in the middle of a respectful conversation or one that is disrespectful. And if it's the former, then stick it out and see where it goes. And if it's the latter, be totally okay. Just getting up, walking away from the table. And but so it all, the essence of this, as we said, it all comes down to, if you believe, you, you know what the market will bear. And if you, you believe that you have that value, you know, it's, it's a, it is a non-personal thing to try and get what you're worth. It, I mean, it's it is, a non-personal well, thing at that it, point. It feels personal because you're talking about your worth, but yeah. at, at the end of the day, it's a dollar transaction and it's a, uh, 
But the core of it is you have to believe you, the time you've put in learning your craft, the time you put in rehearsing and practicing your craft, the time you put in driving, the time you put in money, you put in investing in your equipment, all of that type of stuff. You have to believe that there is an exchange. If they didn't want music there for something that was good for their party winery, you know, whatever it may be, you know, if they, if, if music was a nice to have, they'd be able to walk away from it if it was too much. That's if they right. want music there, there's a value to it. And you got to you know, but and, no, and, and, and no in one. the cosmic sense, in the cosmic sense, it's part of your commitment to the, the brotherhood and sisterhood of, of musicians, Absolutely. people trying to make the world a little bit better by putting some joy into the air. You know, you have to believe in your commitment to that, to that, fraternity um as part of the deal when you start taking money for gigs that's correct yeah and you also like don't it know what other people are being paid in your area too for similar gigs right like you got a level set a little bit and if you feel for some reason like you're worth twice that or three times that well be prepared to explain why to the people that that want uh you know that want you for say you know standard rate but also be ready to ask someone else to explain why when, you know, if if the standard bar gig where you are is 100 bucks a person and you've got some bar that says, yeah, I want to pay you 40. Say, well, you know, like be willing to to stand up and say, well, the normal rate around here is about 100, 150 a person. Is, is there something I'm missing about what you're what you're proposing here that 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 makes what you're proposing make sense and, and make them defend it in a, in a respectful way. And if they can't, which, you know, in a scenario like that, I can't imagine how they would, but you never know. Open mind, open ears. Right. And, and then be willing to walk away and Agreed. also understand the value of walking away as a negotiation tactic. Right. Because sometimes they'll come back. Sometimes they'll come back. Oh, you know, I'm sorry, you, you know, this didn't work out for you. I'd love to play for you some time. You know, please come see me, you know, c come see what I'm all about. Come see what our band is all about. Come see the type of crowd we draw. Come see the unique music we have. Always push the positives. But that's reaffirming your belief and commitment in what you have to offer. And so, you know, the way you walk away, can, you know, it just doesn't make sense in business to slam any doors shut. It just doesn't make any sense. Right. Right. Um, you right. Know, you don't need this person to love you. You just need them to have the door open in case they need That's to it. buy what you have to sell. That's it. Just say, yep, this doesn't work out today. It's all good. All good. All good. Fun. Well, there you go. That's what we got this week. You got anything What do we else? call on this episode? Uh, I don't know. The, the last chapter I created was believe first, negotiate second. Ah. <laughs> 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 You're like Shakespeare with these with these uh, episode titles. I got to tell you. <laughs> well, you know, it's just it's it's when I'm not thinking about it is when the good stuff comes out, right? Isn't it's, that life? That's life, exactly. It's music for sure. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, dude. So, thanks for uh, for listening, folks. Yeah, for sure, man. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Dave. We'll hey, see you next buddy. Week. Yeah, man. Always be performing. Oh, that's what I'm trying to do, man. Two more, three more rehearsals starting in about an hour and a half. Kill it. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. It's all I know how to do, man. Take it easy. See you next week, folks.